<clears throat> what the Iranians most wished for, they never gained, and what they most sought to preserve, they lost. That sentence, written by James Buchan, an Oxford University trained Persianist in his 2013 book about modern Iran, entitled Days of God, remains in my mind the single best one sentence summary of the Iranian Revolution, which today turns 40, that I have ever read and that I have ever heard. I'm Behnam Ben Talablu, and I serve as a research fellow focusing on Iran at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, D.C. Today at FTD, we're proud to welcome members of the U.S. government, diplomatic corps, think tank and policy community, and media. Thank you all for joining us. As I mentioned just a moment ago, the revolution in Iran turns 40 today, an event that the regime in Tehran is sure to felicitate, an event that many Iranians, be they inside Iran or in the diaspora, are likely lamenting. Has it really been 40 years, exclaimed my mother this past weekend, who through some stroke of coincidence was born in Iran two decades before the revolution, but also on February 11th. That's the 22nd of Batman for those of you who know your Persian calendar well. Yes, it has been 40 years. And what have we seen from Iran in these past four decades? In my view, it's one word, dissonance. Dissonance between the Iran we know through our friends and families and the Iran we hear of and read in books and newspapers and see on TV. Dissonance between state and society. Dissonance between the center and the periphery. Dissonance between national interest and regime interest. And lastly, dissonance between what the Iranian people were promised and the current reality in which they find themselves. Was it like this 40 years ago as the Shah fled, as Khomeini returned, and as the army declared neutrality, and as the revolutionary forces declared victory? For the past 40 years, the Iranian state has been defined and explained in contrast to the prevailing norms of the world system, which it rejects. So, what are the forces that turned Iran into such a revolutionary regime? Where did Iran's current cadre of leaders come from? And what convictions did they covet, carry, and conceal? What was the state of civil society then, compared to now? And perhaps most importantly, after 40 years, where is Iran headed to from here? To help explore these important questions, we're honored today to have four distinguished scholars of Iran, all of whom have been widely published on the revolution, as well as its causes and consequences. Moderating the discussion is FDD senior fellow Ruel Mark Garecht, who in a previous life was in the clandestine service at the CIA, serving as an Iran targets officer. He is joined by Ray Takia, the Hasib J. Sabah senior fellow for Middle East Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, where he focuses on Iran. Previously, Ray was at the State Department early in the Obama administration and before that at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Next is Hushang Shahabi, a professor of international relations and history at Boston University. Hushang has taught and lectured at countless other academic institutions on Iran and Islamist movements around the world. And last but not least, we have Ghulam Reza Afghami, the director in, of the Oral History Program and director of social science research and international studies at the Foundation for Iranian Studies. Prior to the revolution, he was Deputy Minister of Interior in Iran. In addition to keeping our eyes on the present in Iran and what it holds for the future, today, FED is doing something different. FED is making sure the analytical community, the media, and the international community does not forget about the past. Not because of any particular academic inclination or obsession, but because the past matters. Iran's leaders, hardened men shaped by history who prefer the term revolutionaries more than anything else, rightly understand this. That's why all that came before the revolution is treated in Iran today more as narrative history and state secret rather than straight empirical history. By way of housekeeping, I should note that in addition to being live streamed, today's event is being graciously covered by C-SPAN. So I encourage guests seated here or watching online to join in on the conversation via Twitter uh, using the handle at FDD and also kindly silence your cell phones or electronic devices. Now, please join me in extending a warm welcome to the panel. And Ruel, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Sir Behnam. Uh, I'm going to do something uh, atypical for me uh, because I like to hog the moderator chair. I'm actually going to turn it over to my good friend Ray Take because Ray 
uh, is writing a book on the Islamic uh, Revolution, and uh, I've had the great pleasure of actually uh, sharing conversations with him almost daily on what he's uncovered and the material that uh, he, he's working on. Uh, I will just, uh, and I want to say this about uh, Ray, uh, because it needs to be said, there are very few individuals I have ever met in Washington, D.C., who, uh, when they enter government service, uh, Ray retain their curiosity and a certain historical uh, uh, desire to, to get into uh, government documents. Uh, that's largely because people are very busy, government work is very hard, and uh, it dulls you. Uh, Ray is the exception to that. Uh, when he got into government, he actually started reading uh, the government documents on Iran, and I think it uh, helped change his life. Uh, just one other little thing, then I'll turn it over to Ray. Uh, we may actually um, uh, today get the opportunity to actually reject uh, James Buchan's line uh, on the revolution. Uh, uh, at least the two of us uh, fundamentally disagree with it. But uh, I'll let that play out uh, in today's discussion, and I'll turn it over to uh, I'll turn it over to Ray. Thanks very much, and thanks for FDD for doing this. Uh, uh, conversation about history is rare in this town. I like to begin by asking Professor Shahabi, uh, and I want to focus on the years before the storm, 70 to 76. Uh, there was a lot of discontent in Iran at that point, whether it was an armed struggle, whether it was a variety of other religious revivals. Could you set the stage about why was Iranians, why was Iran between the years 70 to 76 was in such state of discontent given the fact that there was a growing economy? It, it, Iran at those years felt like a dynamic country that nobody wanted to live in. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you tell me why is it that there was such pervasive discontent in those years? I think the main thing to do is to avoid generalizations. Okay. Um, different Iranians were discontent for different reasons. Uh, the uh, members of uh, the modern middle class uh, were discontent because of uh, censorship, because of lack of participation, because of corruption, but there was a much deeper sense of discontent among many Iranians, perhaps the majority of the population, who felt alienated from the ruling elite. And by the ruling elite, I don't only mean a few thousand people running the country, but uh, the sort of people who are defining the parameters of public culture. This was a discontent over lifestyles. They felt that uh, the people who were running the country, even school directors, etc., were not representative of the deeper values of Iranian society. And the result of that is that when the revolution happened after a few years, we get a total decapitation of Iranian society. I mean, no... Uh, revolution has resulted in such deep a break with the previous social elite as the Iranian revolution. Uh, Professor Aframi, uh, you were in the state. You were working in the Pahlavi bureaucracy. What is the Iran of, that Professor Shahabi described? How does it look from within the state? Because the Shah seemed to, even the Shah seemed to have recognized there's something wrong here. Hushang, uh, Nahal Vandion has put together a scholarly committee to address these issues. What does the Iran before the revolution and its discontent look from those who were managing the state? Um, let me begin with this in order to see what was happening before and afterwards. One of them is this, that as far as I'm I know nobody is perfect, and the Shah, of course, had his issues, problems. On the other hand, he had uh, significant uh, dimensions of commitment to the country, to Iran, to what it could become, which uh, many people did not agree with or did not see it. But he thought that Iran was in a position that in fact it could become uh, one of the major countries of the world and it could uh, do this thing and he was working for that. 
or trying to work for that. Uh, in the process, of course, you know, there were certain mistakes made uh, that he came to understand and to uh, try to do something about it. But it seems to me that the essential issues you know, that came up, it wasn't as a result of, uh, because if you, if you know, by 1975, for example, Iran was a country in which uh, uh, um, uh, a lot of people from outside and a lot of Iranians Students and others were turning back to Iran in order to work over there. It wasn't like uh, that you would say that uh, it, it was a failing uh, country. In fact, nobody thought, nobody thought that something like the uh, Islamic uh, Revolution would happen until it came to the end and it did happen. In fact, uh, no one in the United States, for example, there were very few people who might have thought it in those terms. Uh, the uh, um, Sullivan, for example, the ambassador to Iran, came out only in the uh, in the November, I think it was, that he wrote back to the uh, state that uh, uh, um, something something uh, odd is happening, and uh, we must be uh, thinking about those things and so on. So, in that sense, I think that uh, uh, it's difficult to say that at least as far as I, I can tell, both at the university as I was and then, uh, or, and then across the country, that a majority of Iranians, in the sense that was just said, were unhappy when you're thinking about it in, uh, let's say, in the 1970s uh, to, to uh, later on. Then something terrible happened, something very bad happened in two ways. One of them was that suddenly we got uh, a lot of money coming out of oil. Uh, it became too much of it. In the, and that corresponds to something else where uh, uh, the doctors came and told the show that he had a big problem. Uh, and that they did not exactly told him what that problem was, but whatever it was and the way that they said it, he understood that this, this is my take. I kind of, he understood that uh, he didn't have that much time. And as a result of that, when money had suddenly uh, you know, increased manifold, and that he wanted to do this thing, he started of doing things that essentially the infrastructure in Iran was not able to deal with it. And as a result of that, all kinds of situations came up with respect to which then everybody began to say that there is something going on very badly in Iran. And that is how we are looking at what it was. Because otherwise, when you look at Iran and you, you, you uh, compare it to what it was in, let's say, the beginning of the 20th century, and what it had become when the revolution occurred, then you would see some uh, um, changes that if there is time, we can talk about it. But it does say that Iran was moving in a direction that uh, had this revolution not occurred, uh, which is something else that I suppose at some point we're going to talk about, uh, then at this time, uh, when we looked at Iran, if we took any uh, curve of change in any dimension of interest for any society in terms of moving forward, and you would take it from where it was you know, in the beginning of the 20th century to 1976, uh, 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 77, 78, and then you just uh, continue it not at that curve, lower than that, but continue to, uh, to, uh, to this time. And then you compare it to what Iran is now and what it could have been. Then we do get a sense of the uh, opportunity cost of the Islamic Republic for the people of Iran, as it was, and then so. But let me stop over here and we can All talk right. uh, about this. Let me turn to Ruel Grek, who my dear friend Ruel, who spent the 1980s in CIA clandestine services, 
perhaps yet another reason why the Islamic Republic is still here today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is a lot of discussion about intelligence failure. I want to read a couple of excerpts randomly and get your opinion on it. Uh, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, National Intelligence estimate, estimate of Iran in 1969, quote, demand for greater political participation by the educated groups are likely to grow if such participation is not limited and if Iran's economic progress falter, this could pose a serious problem for this narrowly based regime, particularly if the descent in the military. 1975 CIA report, dissent among civil servants in Iran has now reached alarming degree even though superficially everything appears normal on the surface. Students and the labor groups have always been the source of discontent, but now the malaise has reached the civil servants. Uh, 1975 NIE, prominent in the opposition are religious leaders and though the religious and through the, them the religious establishment. Religion has become a major influence on urban lower classes and the bazaar merchants. Even the intelligentsia who in other circumstances would be scornful of religious establishment now apparently perceive the religious leaders sharing common grievances against the present system. The report goes on to suggest Ayatollah Khomeini commands considerable support and popularity in Bazaar and elsewhere in Iran. Uh, where's the intelligence failure? Well, I, I, I think you could say there's a big difference between the analytical assessment of a general malaise and then being able to predict that you're going to have a revolution at a given moment. I mean, I think the, the American intelligence community, and that would also include the State Department, was well aware of, of problems uh, in Iran. Uh, and I, I, I don't think that really was the question. The question was, uh, should they have had a better idea, a sharper idea in the uh, late 1970s uh, that this could actually escalate into a full-blown Islamic revolution? I don't know. The, the retrospective game is a hard one. When I was looking at certainly agency files, which I looked at in a fair amount of detail, uh, what was clear is that uh, the Americans weren't trying to spend a lot of time uh, understanding Iranian society. Certainly the CIA wasn't by the late 1970s. What has been said uh, that, that Henry Kissinger had a deal with the Shah, that the Americans weren't going to really work the Iranian target, that the primary objective would be the Soviet target, I think that sort of bears some fruit. You see it in reporting. I don't know how good American reporting would have been if Kissinger hadn't made that agreement. Uh, I mean, when the revolution happened, I believe there wasn't a single CIA officer, for example, who had Persian on the ground. There were two officers who did, Michael Matrenko and John Limpert. Both of them were state officers. Uh, and it would be good. Uh, John was actually supposed to be here, and I'd asked Michael to be here, but uh, I can't get him away from his farm in Pennsylvania. It would be good to have their perspective as they look back now to see you know, how much do they really appreciate. Uh, and also, uh, at that time, how, whether they were in favor of the revolution or not. I think you had a real disconnect in Washington. There were some who actually were very sympathetic to the downfall of the Shah. And then there were others who were oblivious. And then there were those like Kissinger, I think. I mean, he's a bit earlier, who I think was just delusional. I mean, I remember a, a party in Paris where Kissinger was explaining to a young Iranian woman where uh, if they'd only, her generation had only been more patient, uh, then somehow uh, the Shah would have taken Iran to a new secular age. I mean, in and of itself, I think that shows you how little he knew about uh, the Islamic Republic uh, and uh, the recipe for a giant mess, uh, particularly when the Americans started to indulge the Shah's appetite for weaponry. So, you know, I, it, that's a good, it's an excellent question, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's, it's easy to answer. Uh, let me return to you, Professor Shahabi. Uh, Iran in late 70s has 9,000 mosques, um, 50 ayatollahs. 
uh, a venerable party called the National Front, a liberation party of Mehdi Bazagan mm -hmm. that you yourself have written about, mm -hmm. a variety of other opposition actors. How did Khomeini come to exercise such complete hegemony over such diverse collection of forces, almost none of whom shared his objective? Well, first of all, the National Front and the Liberation Movement were there in name only. I mean, mm. these were uh, groups that hadn't been active since the early 1960s. Uh, a bunch of uh, men uh, over the age of 70, unconnected. There was no social base for them. Uh, they had lingering prestige because of their association with Mossadegh, but not more than that. The real opposition uh, were more radical groups, uh, like the Fadayan, like the Mujahideen, Marxists, uh, etc., Kurdish regionalists uh, in the west of the country, for instance. And uh, basically, everybody saw a different Khomeini. Uh, because, of course, uh, many of these people knew exactly what the clergy are like. They are anti-clerical, like many religious Iranians are anti-clerical, because they see the clergy as hypocrites. Except the notion was always Khomeini is different. Uh, the clerics are like this, but Khomeini is not a typical cleric. And if you read his book, Islamic Government, there are very vicious attacks against the traditional clergy. Uh, so uh, they said, yeah, I mean, we are uneasy about the clerics, about the clergy, but Khomeini is different. Uh, and so uh, that allowed them to uh, accept his leadership. Uh, perhaps a lot of wishful thinking was involved, uh, but there was nobody else. And in, as far as people who really knew him, I mean, Bozagon knew him personally, uh, they thought that uh, if they um, do not go under his umbrella, they'd be totally marginalized, they'll become irrelevant. Um, and one man who proved that uh, to be true is Bakhtiar. I mean, Bakhtiar broke with him, mm -hmm. and look what happened to him. And so that uh, if they uh, went under his umbrella, given that he was suspicious of the traditional clergy, perhaps they could keep him away from the ultra-puritanical conservatives and nudge him into a moderate, more moderate direction, which of course failed, but that's a prediction with the benefit of hindsight. So therefore you have to presuppose that there was some sort of a religious revival in the country for the cleric to emerge however sanitized, as the leadership of an opposition movement. Yeah. Shiism became the religion, became an ideology of dissent and rebellion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, can, can I add just one sure. thing on that point? I mean, I, I actually think in the American government there was a real resistance, and the same thing was true with a lot of Iranians. The idea of clerical rule just seemed a little far-fetched. It just didn't seem likely. Uh, you know, I don't know how many American officials, you know, aware of the history from, say, Bakia Majlisi forward, right. but uh, uh, that there was actually a, a tradition of uh, what you might call profound clerical interjection of the government, if not uh, a certain desire to actually rule. But the, I, I don't think that that just simply wasn't digested, uh, and hence uh, Khomeini's advantage. Well, I mean, what I'm trying to get to mm. is, and maybe I'm sorry to. Professor, uh, is there is a question, and Bahman introduced it. What did Iranians revolt for in 1979? It is, given the choice of leadership that they made, given the individual they turned to, is it fair to say, I think it's indisputable to suggest, that they revolted for an Islamic government? No, necessarily. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, if you, all you have to do is to look at the slogans that people shouted in the course of the demonstrations. Okay. They, uh, they believed wrongly, wrongly, now we know wrongly, but at the time they believed that uh, the Shah was an American puppet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, they uh, called for independence, okay. uh, which meant uh, curtailing American influence in this country. Uh, they revolted against uh, uh, corruption in high places. Um, and yes, a very important part uh, revolted for Islam, but not, uh, not everybody. Not everybody was uh, Islamic. And of course, one thing we have to keep in mind is that precisely in the 1970s, we get the emergence of an Islamist counter-elite. 
right. because that's the point when uh, students from poorer backgrounds enter university and uh, the atmosphere at the universities changes. Many secular Iranians now go to the United States or to Europe to study, and the universities become a hotbed of Islamist agitation. And so it's this, this emergence of an Islamist counter elite of educated people who can speak about modern problems, who can speak about social problems, who can speak about the economy, that was also one of the factors in the Islamization of the revolution movement. Did you have something? You know, well, uh, this is very exactly that, you know, that uh, Dr. Shalvi was just talking about. For one thing, you have to, in order to get this thing, you have to start from the beginning of it, that where it actually starts, which goes somewhere uh, just after uh, President Carter came to Iran uh, in that, uh, and, and left. And then just a, f um, a few days after was uh, Khomeini started talking about uh, how terrible the Iranian situation was. And no, he was doing it, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, I know, but before, continuing I mean, this mm, uh, yeah. uh, immediately like that. And then, and then a couple of months uh, afterwards, you know, you had this thing in Tabriz that uh, it was a religious up rising that started over there. Essentially, that was that. And then from that, the, they uh, started going on every uh, 40 days and so on. And then that was the beginning of it that started, started going. The essential uh, point is that this revolution, from the time that it began, from the time that it began, it was controlled by the clerics, by the clergy. It was controlled by the clergy because they have been much better organized than any other group that existed over there. At the beginning, they came, and it was something that was happening. Nobody was particularly concerned about how this is going to end. It came on, and then it took, and it began you know, to, uh, uh, to develop and coming back. Sometime about uh, uh, the middle of uh, 1978, uh, the military began to uh, be very nervous about what was happening. It was trying to get the Shah, because this is a very important matter to have in mind, that somehow the military culture had evolved in this way that unless the Shah ordered them to do something, they would not do it. And now the Shah told them that you can come into the street, but you don't have, uh, you shouldn't shoot at anybody. You shouldn't kill anybody. You think they would have? Uh, uh, that they would have? Yeah. I think they would. Okay. No, no. There, there, it may be. A, a... It may be. No, I know people say a lot of things that they don't know uh, exactly well, what no, the military no, no, no. and relationship just, with the, the Shah deliberations was. of military itself. When, suggest they when didn't you want to come, do it. when you come, to, yeah, because the military essentially was not made for doing this kind of right. thing. That's other people were, but it wasn't the same thing as if the Shah ordered them to do something, they would not do it. They would do that. But it, the point is that he uh, let me. May I tell you something about my own personal experience with the Shah? Okay. It was sometime in, in uh, 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 I would say September, uh, Sharif Imami had become, uh, had, had become prime minister. And a number of us, a lot of us, actually thought that this was the worst kind of uh, you know, uh, do to do, you know, to put him uh, as prime minister. A lot of people talked to me and so on. I was able to go and see the show because I was the Secretary General of the National Committee for World Literacy Program at that time, of which the show was the head, but wasn't particularly concerned. And when I went to see him, I was, they, they said that he is coming uh, in order <laughs> to make it possible, because he was very busy with the number of other things, he said that I have some uh, uh, something to take to him from Mr. Amini, who was there, a very important person. So as soon as I go in there, he tells me, what is it that Mr. Amini wants, you know, that you want to come over there? And I now have to find a way of saying that it wasn't really Mr. Amini that he, but I came over here on my own. 
And I said that uh, we are in a horrible situation in this country because we're moving in a direction that, was, that is going to be absolutely uh, 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 you know, dis uh, disturbing the whole, the, whole, the whole situation. And then he said how we are doing things and so on. And I, I yeah, sort of uh, said that, well, you see, there are seems like there are two options to your majesty, to the king. Uh, one is for you that in the name of the history of Iran, in the name of the future of Iran, in the name of what has happened so far, that your majesty puts his military uh, things on. And I hadn't finished when I was going to say this, that he said that if it comes to that, I would rather leave Iran. I would not do that, leave it on. And then I said that in that case, uh, perhaps you should put uh, somebody else, and then, and then the rest of it was nonsense, because right. we just talked and he does and, and things that had, had no relationship to it. But it does, does show that this man, this man, in fact, uh, denied his military the possibility of stopping this thing before it came to a position where it was impossible to stop, which that was probably around November or so, uh, because uh, you know, I, I would assume. I, I, I can't tell. I, I, I don't know for sure. But it is, it is uh, I think, important to put all of these things in context of what the situation was at that time or not. There is no doubt that the uh, uh, that Khomeini's followers had getting the control of what was going on. But it was really have very little to do with what Bazargan did or what the other one did or what uh, uh, any of these uh, people did, even, even uh, uh, the uh, people who were on the actual left, even though well, they can I Can I mm -hmm. cheat in here? Can, so do you, in your own mind, do you think Savak failed? Me? Yeah. Uh, no, I think Savak. Uh, I, I, I think Savak is too. I think it's too exaggerated in terms of the power that Savak had. Uh, the Savak had it because, in fact, the country was moving forward. Once it started something like this, the Savak, in fact, didn't seem to have any power of doing anything. No, he but could the, do. But, he could do with uh, some people, but but we, the Islamic Republic has published vast majority of Salak files. There's 110 volumes in the library. Yeah, of yeah, I know. I've seen that. Yeah. And what I what I'm not saying the Ruel's question that they could have they coercively stopped it. I'm saying in the 7234, where the analytical division of Salak saying to the Shah, we have a problem here because the Salak files that I have seen are almost entirely surveillance, mm -hmm. which means nobody really could go to the Shah and say, this is, we're in a difficult situation in 74, 75, 76. I mean, what was Samak, no, no, I know what CIA was saying, I read little experts over there. What is Samak saying to, I mean, Nasiri is not a guy who goes, frankly, as a character to go in and say, boss, you got a problem. Uh, well, I, I don't know, to be honest with you, I don't know. I would think, you know, that they would take all of these things that happened across, you know, they took right. it to the show. I know I don't know whether they did it, uh, how they did it, and so on. I was not privy to that. To that. But I know that this was taken to him. It was taken to him that how it was, you know, it, the, the, the thing was that what he uh, actually uh, thought that things were happening. The guy thought that, for one thing, when he went out, everybody came out and said uh, all kinds of you know, fantastic things about how great he was and everything else. And, and uh, so it, this thing, this thing that happened, you know, when he went out and, on, on, you know, on, on a helicopter to see what is going on, mm -hmm. and then they brought him, you know, the, the uh, thing that how they talked about him. Right. He was absolutely uh, flabbergasted, and he just was saying all the time, now look what they were saying. Look what they were saying about me. This is, uh, 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 you know, you know, 
to ask why the revolution occurred, at least for me, I just can't have no answer for it. If you ask how it did, yeah. then I think we can move on and say well, what let happened. Me ask you, when uh, they started. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you. Uh, when did the Shah give up on this regime? I think about uh, the time that I talked to him. Not September. No, I don't know. It may have been, as far as he is concerned, it was a little bit before that. Uh, he was all the time coming out, says that they are doing these things, you know, it's the left and the right, and uh, they want to take the country back. They want to do, which I, I presume once Khomeini came and then what he, was, uh, uh, he had in his uh, book and what, uh, as Rafsanjani said later on, that uh, Imam had come and whatever Imam had said, you know, was the law, and therefore we tried to make the law legal, put everything that he had said and the kind that he had said it in the Constitution, so that at least what was happening was all uh, uh, legally uh, justified, which he did that. Uh, for the Shah, I, I have no idea when, maybe, maybe a little before. At any rate, this was my experience that he told me that, which I was very surprised. Would you agree with you. September would be the time and he mm. sort of said, I'm done with this? Um, I would probably, I mean, I wasn't there. I was a student uh, in the United States. So I defer to uh, Dr. Afghani's uh, views. But my hunch would be to make it a little bit later, to make it November or December. Because I cannot, I cannot give you a reason. The Shah spends, and I don't want to spend too much time, spends the fateful summer of Iran, like summer of 78, everybody leaves town. The Shah spends most of that summer in Caspian. Yeah, he was in. He was in his Caspian. And when he comes back, and Shah's habit was he would open up himself to the Westerners. So he starts telling Parsons and others that this is out of hand. And he's had another unusual habit. He would open himself up to Western journalists. So when New Yorkers correspondent comes in September, the Shaw says well, there's no use of force available, which promptly appears in the December mm. issue of the New Yorker when the military government is in power. He, I, I think September seems to be the date where he kind of throws in the towel. Now, I'm one of the few people that's prepared to defend the Sharif Amami administration. Uh, I think I'm the only one. Uh, and I'll be brief, uh, and I'll tell you from, uh, I think there, as you know, in the summer, Hoveida, and to some extent, Mokaddam, the new head of Samak, are negotiating with Shariat Madari for some kind of a compromise. And it falls apart. And Shariat Madari suggests that after Rex Cinema, that we have to have a new government with two prime ministers that he recommended. It was Amini and Sharif Amami. And the Shah hated Amini. And Sharif Amami had connections to the clerical community. And he begins the negotiating process with Shariat Amor, Sh Sharif Adam, uh, Madori and Bazargan. <laughs> and he succeeds. He does get an agreement with Bazar gone. Mm. He does get an agreement, the 13-point plan. Mm. <coughs> and they take it to Imam in Paris, and Imam says no. Uh, so he does have an agreement about the future of the monarchy that's been signed off by Shariat Matari and Mehdi Bazar gone. And both those individuals proved guts. None of them were Republicans. Uh, and none of them had guts enough to defy the Imam. Uh, so that's only. <laughs> success that one can think of. Let me ask you the role of the United States, because it hasn't come up, or it hasn't come up substantially. It is fair to say that the role of the United States in these deliberations, in this movement, was absolutely completely inconsequential. Here's why. Cyrus Vance wants a coalition government that Khomeini will not allow. Brzezinski wants the military to shoot that the military and the Shah won't. You can go home after that. I mean, why have another interagency meeting? <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. What do you do after that? If you're, if you're David Aaron and you're Cy Vance and you and you Carter, I mean, then what? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I think the, uh, 
I think the Americans were deeply confused, and their, the amount of leverage they had was highly limited. They didn't have many people on the ground. Uh, and you know, once it became clear, I mean, the Americans, I actually think the Americans would have had a very hard time backing the use of force. Uh, something Brzezinski wanted to do. And did call the shot in November saying, go, go ahead and clear the streets. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, it, did, it did not happen. And because the shot wouldn't do it. Right. And, right. He, I, and I would say his military wouldn't do it, had he yeah. ordered it. But you and I can disagree on that. Yeah, well, I mean, those are not. You no, know, these are the sort of things that you know, I, um, I may very well defer to you. But to I mean, on, on are, this, because it's called the yeah, past yeah, and you yeah. never know. Nobody knows exactly whether they, they would or not. That's I think it. the conscript would. Uh, the, the, but, well, what I'm saying that they could not. You know, when you come, yeah. when you come at the time, you know that we are talking about. You know, yeah. say uh, October, November, uh, this way, this yeah. side. Yeah. I mean, Vance. Then essentially, the whole situation had changed. Yeah, but in, in both of them, <coughs> both yeah, Vance and Brzezinski were correct about each other's option. Right. Vance was correct to say there's no military option. Brzezinski was correct to say there's no coalition government option. Yeah. And after that, you can pretty much put a go on fishing sign on your door and go home because what's there to do? Uh, but anyways, I'll, uh, uh, it, it, I'll just one more before I open up. Yes. Well, Khomeini put it very well. He said America can't do a damn thing. And he, he was not wrong. Uh, were they, in your views, and I'll open up after question, inflection points between January 78 to January 79, Charlotte? Inflection points where this thing could have done could have gone different way. Yeah. 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 It, it, you mean? You mean? Mm. What was it? Yeah, well, well, but we see the other side of what you are saying is that they they they, they uh, uh, revolution yeah. was inevitable. Well, I'm just. This is what I'm asking. Well, they certainly were was they, not. What, what, what were those points not. where things could have no, gone I, differently? I, I would say that anywhere, you know, in the first part of the 1978. Uh, it wasn't like January. That. So. No, you can go on to uh, uh, afterwards. Right. Uh, even then, the the thing is that uh, as Hori became prime uh, became prime minister, that's November seventy eight. November seventy eight. Even then, you know, if he went over there, said even though he was very much afraid of doing this, yeah. that he didn't want to go there, and they pushed him, right. and the shop pushed him, you know, to go and become that like that. And then, but for two. Uh, Two or three days, uh, four days, five days—I don't know how long. Mm -hmm. uh, everything quieted down because they, you know, then then he started talking about law, 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 and, and, and all sorts of things in there. And then everybody else came out and said, "Well, this guy uh, doesn't seem to be exactly, you know, the kind of thing that one right. could be afraid of." But uh, no, I mean, I mean. Uh, so you could you could be stopped at any point. Oh, it could not at any point. You know, as I say, you know, By there November. was a time then. Then the, the, the military actually, had, you know, uh, you know, a time came. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to say these things. It came, came. I had I had guests in my house. That was the night, you know, that uh, Khomeini was going to be seen in the moon. And then these people were university people. Uh, they, they had, well, I don't want to, because if I tell you what the, uh, uh, you know, their uh, you know, the thing was, you know, what did they teach and all of that, then most likely a lot of people over here, or some of them at least, could tell who, who it is and who was not, and I don't want to do that. But they were from you know, a range of uh, 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 teaching, you know, that had come, you know, from you know, and then and, uh, I, when, when the moon comes out and all of that, I, f he, I, I uh, you know, suddenly feel that uh, everybody is just moving around and they don't know. Anyway, we had placed, you know, a sort of a uh, galoon in front of us and so on. So they come out and they started looking at the moon to see whether actually this is or not. And some of them <laughs> were, were tracing, you know, faces. Uh, that tells me that by this time that we are talking about, uh, the mood of the country had changed. And this doesn't mean, you know, that this was the mood uh, 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 eight months or two years or uh, three years before that. That is why it is a process. That as a result of this process, you uh, uh, achieve a kind of force and power that you couldn't even think that you could have it. I don't believe really 
Shad Khomeini, even though he was willing you know, to go and get killed or whatnot or everything else. But I doubt very much that a year before that, that this happened, he thought essentially that he would succeed mm, I agree. in this thing. Uh, so this is a process, and we have to realize that uh, 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 that process, when it begins, it doesn't mean that at that beginning of it, it's inevitab right. uh, inevitably meaning you know coming to uh, Can I add something sure, to this? Please. Which is, I think in 1977, there might have been inflection points. I think the point of no return comes with the onset of mass mobilization on the streets in January 1978. In 1977, if the Shah had said, OK, I do away with the monopoly of the Rastakhiz party, we have free elections. Um, Bozagon himself thought that the Mossadegh might get about 25% MPs mm -hmm. in a free election. He didn't think he could win the election. But that might have diffused uh, the tension, channeled it into electoral competition, which would have taken the sting out of the opposition. And if the Shah had killed, the, killed Khomeini? Yeah. It's easier or it's more gruesome. Yeah. Uh, Professor Afon, one last thing for you. Uh, did the Shah actually believe he was overthrown by Khomeini? Uh, no. I, mean, I, I, can't, I can't be sure of that. But I think essentially that he thought that all of this thing was moving because there were others. Other and others being? Others being Americans, others being uh, uh, Europeans, others being whoever. Because essentially he thought that this, I'm guessing, I'm guessing. Well, you don't have to guess. He said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, this was, <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, you're yeah, paraphrasing. Yeah, you're paraphrasing <laughs> him. Yeah, but but that is that is uh, was part of it. Uh, well, in fact, but, but this is something you know that I think is important to have in mind. There were no one, no one that was actually a part of running that country, running that country in the government and all these and all of these things really thought, uh, even though they knew that there are these people who are having a certain amount of power and commitment, but nobody there thought at that time that actually this is possible. They could, they thought, they thought that it is, because, because what Khomeini was saying was so outrageous uh, that you wouldn't think you know, that people would go for it. So it must have been the CIA. <laughs> no. I mean, I mean, I don't think You see, CIA is somewhat exaggerated in many ways. I mean, I'm sorry. Well, no, no, the CIA, no, no, this, no. This, this CIA didn't. CIA, no, I mean, but, oh, hold on. Yeah. CIA has never said we did it. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, they, they made a point of reference that we did not do the Iran. They can do or what they cannot. They're fairly adamant. It was the British. They're fairly adamant on that point. Yeah. I just want to. <laughs> repeat, I mean, for over 150 years throughout almost all of the Middle East, uh, the secular military men had been beating the hell uh, out of the religious establishments. Uh, they were submerging. Uh, so it's not at all surprising that the idea that a cleric could come back and essentially rule the roost, it was, it was pretty unthinkable. Anyway, I'll open up to the questions. Please identify yourself and... Ask your question, not a comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Shahir Etzbinani, uh, let's move forward a little, little bit away from history. Uh, well, uh, we don't do that. What's your prediction? What's your prediction, like uh, what anniversary will be the final anniversary of the Islamic Republic? Uh, if, if we don't have to do this, but if you want to do this, that's, that's your prerogative. Because this is one session that we decided we're going to devote to history. If you want to know about JCPOA, good or bad, and have the taste filling, less taste great, less filling debate, there are plenty of places you can do that. Uh, what's the final anniversary? Who knows? Yeah, historically I, I, speaking, I but don't did, know. Well, let me ask you a question <laughs> yeah. that's different. Will there be a final anniversary to the Islamic Republic? Well, I comparing it with other revolutions, revolutionary regime regimes have a great deal of longevity. Mm -hmm. I mean, the French Revolution was defeated by outside powers uh, mm. in 1815. The Chinese communists are still there. The Cuban communists are still there. 
Russia, well, is not exactly a liberal democracy. Right. So um, uh, my prediction for my own lifetime is more of the same. Uh, sir. Radwan uh, Ziad, ACW. Uh, my question to the idea of Vilayat al Faqih, uh, because when you read actually the book of Khomeini, he never mentioned actually Vilayat al Faqih in his book of Islamic governance. Uh, when this idea came into uh, Khomeini and he believed that it's important to implement it because this is actually, it's a minor within the Sunni or even within the Shia fuqa. Uh, and what, what's inspired him actually to create uh, Vilayat al-Faqih to be the dominant of the Islamic structure of Republic of Iran? Uh, I, my impression was, and you tell me, uh, that it was in the Islamic, Hukumat Islami yeah. book. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that was yeah, the, and the and first, and he does mention it, in, uh, he, he gave 130 interviews in Paris where he wasn't supposed to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, and when people asked him, uh, he would say it would be a government where the by clerics will be in, mm -hmm. in form of legislation. He would say things like Prophet Muhammad was not a person who hit from temporal power. I mean, uh, and he was very clear about what he was saying. Now, there are t the, 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 journalism, the journalism as a profession failed Iran in 1979. Because when you went to interview Khomeini, you had to submit questions in advance. And those answers would be written by Bani Sadra and others. <laughs> the few occasions where Khomeini would directly answer questions were actually with academics, like when Said Adjoman went and saw him with Marmizonas. And they would come out with a hair on fire about the things that he was saying. So I, I think he was always, the first speech that he gave in the cemetery when he returned, he does mention Bela mm -hmm. And I think that was part of his his perspective, uh, however it contravened normative Shi jurisprudence, I don't think he hit from that. Uh, as I said, New York Times, oh, the failing New York Times, actually profiles the book in December 30th, 1978. Judy Miller writes a story about it. Bernard Lewis was very active in trying to say to people, read this book. Uh, I, I, I think the book was a mystery to those who wish not to know about it. Yeah. And also, of course, you know, the, uh, the book was uh, uh, not allowed to be published everywhere, you know, in Iran, uh, except for the last part of it, which, again, people did not read. Was there awareness of it, though? Yeah, but there was awareness of it. And also, what was in it, I mean, of course, you know, when you read it, uh, it's, uh, it's the sort of a thing that you would think that nobody would accept in the way in which you had uh, put it in, and then, but it was very, uh, 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 how would I put it, uh, l logically following one after another, mm -hmm. because you would say, you know, what, where the uh, authority is, it was God, and how you do this, and mm -hmm. why there were certain kind of people who could do it, and others could not. And that uh, then the same thing is in the constitution of the Islamic Republic now. And so, yeah. No, and, and again, He's just going. on a historical note, the idea of the Velayat al Faqih is actually bubbling in the Shiite blood system. It predates Khomeini. Yeah. Uh, it predates it. I mean, it goes back to the Safavid dynasty. So, I mean, there are, you can see how this idea uh, was developing. It's, it's not, actually, it's, it's not properly belonging to Khomeini. The, uh, the book. Um, has a lot of material about what's wrong with Iranian society. Um, and that resonated, that mm -hmm. part resonated uh, with uh, the readers. And given this perception that he was different from the run-of-the-mill conservative cleric, uh, the uh, hope was, again, wishful thinking, that this was just a theoretical discussion, that it had no bearing on the actual development uh, in Iran, because clerics constantly engage in theoretical discussions uh, which uh, are devising rules that are not meant to be implemented in the real world. So that was a perception. This is a theoretical fiqh discussion. It's not relevant to the actual political life of the country. That's how people, I think, were, uh, were uh, rationalizing it.
But it, it, in the system, in the Shah's system, in the interior ministry in Samark, there was awareness of the book and its content and oh, yeah, its inflammatory yeah, yeah, I'm, language. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. You know, right. Samark certainly knew about the book. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. he was under heavy surveillance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, hello, please. Uh, hello, Falcon of the Hudson Institute, and thank you very much for this really very interesting historical discussion, which is so rare, as was said before. Uh, I, I, my question originally was about just how people understood Khomeini, and partially because of the book. The book was there for a, a very long time, from early 70s, and, um, and the book does, it doesn't really present the doctrine, it presents an argument for it, but I, I so I felt, found helpful the, the accounts that people had all sorts of ways of not understanding it, uh, taking it at face value. So let me ask a different question, which has to do with an observation about the changeover in the universities towards the, from say the mid 70s on. Could you say a little bit more about that and the, the you referred, I think it was Professor Shahabi referred to the is Islamism of the students mm. coming in who, well, the other students, the more, I suppose, more modernized students were often in the Uni United States and elsewhere. What was the content of their Islamism? Was it already Khomeini's views of things or was it something else? Mm. Uh, it was, I think, mostly, uh, mostly informed by the thought of Ali Shariati. Yeah. Uh, and this notion that uh, Shiism is a progressive ideology, they were in competition with the Marxists uh, who had been dominant in the 1950s. Uh, and so basically what they were trying to do was to out-socialist the Marxists and say we're every bit as progressive. We care about imperialism, we care about inequality, we carry uh, care about uh, corruption, uh, etc. So, and you saw that. I mean, I've talked to a number of university uh, presidents at the time, and they were real. They were noticing that the number of women students who wear headscarves was uh, increasing. They didn't quite know what to do about it, uh, but there was certainly a trend. The Islamization precedes the revolution. Let me ask. They were most, I, mean, I think there were two kinds. One was the people from a traditional background, but whose parents would have had a much more traditional religiosity, uh, first generation college students, essentially, uh, who basically found themselves in a tension between the atmosphere at the university with women students, unveiled women students, and the environment of their home, which was very traditional with a, w with a mother wearing a chador, uh, etc. So they solved this tension by becoming progressive Islamists, if you like. But there was also a second group, uh, people who uh, came from a, a smaller group, I would say, from a secular background, who rediscovered their ro spiritual roots. Uh, who basically thought that Iran had thrown out the baby with the bathwater, that not everything about tradition was bad. And uh, this was a trend obviously began by, begun by uh, oppositional uh, people, uh, West struckness, Qab Zadigi, and all of that. But towards the end of the regime, the Shah discovered this as well. I mean, uh, towards, by 1974, 1975, there were people within the Shah's regime which were preaching this uh, gospel of, oh, uh, the spiritual uh, Orient versus the materialist West uh, and all of that. So um, I think th there was a coming together uh, around these values of a progressive Islam. Can I, can ask I, can you can I just say one sure, thing on that? Ahead. I mean, I am old enough to remember uh, Older. Uh, that, that in 1979, I actually knew a fair number of Iranians in the United States who were protesting. Uh, and they were becoming more explicitly Islamic in their protests, uh, even though in their daily habits, of which I had some knowledge, uh, <laughs> they would not qualify as being particularly Islamic. So I think you've got an amalgam here that is becoming ever more explosive, and it's very difficult to you know, draw lines and compartment it. Everything is mixing together. And it's, it's becoming a, a very unstable fuel. I want to ask you about 
you mentioned about the universities and the population of university mm. changes. But the population of the seminary mm. in the 1960s, because it is a point that at this time made that there was a time uh, one of the successful sons of luminaries or people of high officials would enter the clergy. By the 1960s, those people are not entering the clergy. So there are people from lower classes, provinces, and so on, populating the clergy, the seminary. So by the time you get to 1970s, you had this dichotomy of these 50 erudite ayatollahs debating their treaties, and below them are all Khomeini men. Uh, Perhaps not all, but the most visible ones yeah. are. Yeah. And the, the power of Khomeini mm. comes through mm. the fact that the social complexion of the seminary changes. Very much so. And there were fist fights in <laughs> certain seminaries between the supporters of different uh, Grand Ayatollahs. And when you kind of read the reports, according to U.S. government reports, we actually study this thing, they identify 90% of cemeterians as seminarians in terms of political disposition. Uh, Go on to Khomeini. Now they made in ritualistic, the Sharia Mata Khoi, Hakim, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, they may do that. And you see this throughout the, the tragedy of the Shah. I'm mm -hmm. trying to get, a, you can comment on this too. He was a victim of his own success. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, he tried to modernize the Iran society through a land reform program that turned out to be successful. There's been some mm -hmm. evidence of it. And that alienated the land owning aristocracy. He tried to create opportunities in urban areas and others that changed the complexion of the clerical community to his disadvantage. He tried to create scholarship for students. They went abroad. and it, At every step of the way... Don't forget the women. The mm. women, emancipation because of the women movement. That, that is one of the most important things yeah. that were happening you know, in Iran at that uh, time. Because I mean, Russia. the tragedy mm. of the Shah is if he hadn't tried to modernize and better his society, he might have been in power. Mm. <laughs> well, in 19, as early as 1965, uh, the late uh, Sam Huntington in his book, Political Order in Changing Societies, has a whole chapter about that, the tragedy of the modernizer. Uh, Professor Afkhomi, well, I want to ask you about as, as delicately as I can, as anybody <laughs> as, uh, about the... <laughs> no, you don't need to be that delicate. Right? About the, the two types of Shaw's elites, the elite of 50s and 60s. And you can even put Mossadegh in that category of elite. Uh, people such as Amini, uh, Zahiri, the, the father. These are people Alam being the last one of that generation, who had a sense for the country, mm. who could make decisions without the Shah. Uh, the parliament functioned as an institution. The military leadership could act on its own. And by the 1970s, late 60s, you have a different elite. You have Amuzegar, with their PhD in hydraulic from Cornell. I don't know how you get a PhD in hydraulic, but fine. Uh, that don't have a feel for the country. They believe the country should resemble a paradigm that they learned at the Jack Kennedy School. They have no feel for it. Mm. They're in a bubble talking about their paradigms. And the one person who continuously saying things are really, 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 really bad in his diary is Alam, the last of that generation. Uh, did the Shah have an elite and previously that elite saved him in 53 and 63, but he had an elite in 79 that couldn't save him. I mean, I, I, I apologize in advance, but the joke is if in 79, if you want to find Shah's elite, go to Lufthansa Lounge. Uh, Excuse me, what was that? Go to the Lufthansa Lounge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. Uh, but. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but I do want to have a defense of that elite here. The defense. Uh, let me just let me offer no, a defense of them because and, and then you can offer. I, I, I don't have a defense of those. I do. Uh, <laughs> did that elite abandon the Shah 
in fall of 79. Everybody comes back in fall of 79 and waiting to see what the Shah will do. And when he does nothing, then the people started to leave. If the Shah had taken command, that technocratic elite could have served him as good as the traditional elite. But how would you assess? Uh, <coughs> you know, these, these, that. these people that you were talking about, and particularly you know, in the 1940s, you know, people like Musadir, Qabam Sadhani, like, you know, they belong to a different Qabam Qabam and so on. You must also have in mind that they also belonged to a different time. Things were changing even then, you know, in Iran. Yeah. Uh, they uh, were part of the Ajar uh, uh, period. And uh, you, you then, for a period of time, they were out of the uh, play there. And then when there is uh, uh, the uh, Second World War comes and, uh, you know, the uh, Allied uh, occupation. Uh, occupation of Iran, and these people come back and they take various important meetings. And that show is uh, very young at that time and then is coming over. And then, and then, in fact, you know, they are governing and he plays around. But then he's got this relationship even then with the military because of the, his fathers and so on and so forth. Uh, the problem there is that uh, 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 both Qawam and uh, Mossadegh, uh, they also did not particularly realize the importance of having the Shah there, even though they uh, right. accepted him and so on. And as things were moving forward, uh, certain things happened. One of them was the question of nationalization of oil. Right. The Qabam situation with, with, uh, with the Soviets uh, had a very, very uh, uh, difficult uh, implications you know, for a vast number of people in Iran. So there were all of those things involved there. Uh, I'm not quite sure you know, that they were in a position to save Iran, in fact, uh, to save the Shah. In, in, in general, when you look at it, one of the things that um, saved the Shah, the first thing is Furughi, mm -hmm. which is a different yes. thing, not these people. Right. And then at the end of it, you have a, a problem that uh, ended up in uh, the tragedy of the fall of Mossadegh, the way in which he did. And this is a very unfortunate thing. Uh, I must also tell you something. Uh, um, at the beginning, the Shah, in fact, wanted Mossadegh to become prime minister twice, yes. three times more yeah. than that, you know, to become minister for whatever reason. Uh, the the uh, way in which Mossadegh wanted things in order to become prime minister were sort of things, you know, that the system could not accept. It wasn't the Shah, because the first thing was that the Mossadegh comes. I mean, these are funny things. What happened? Mossadegh, when the Shah the first time tells Mossadegh, ask Mossadegh to become uh, prime minister, he says, yes, he will, except that you have to go and ask the British. He says, why my father never asked the British or anybody, you know, if he wanted to have a prime minister. And this is written in, 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 in okay, then he says that, uh, yeah, no, you don't, you're, a, you're, a, you're, you're, you're very young, you don't know these things, but <laughs> you're really new. Then they shall ask him, shall I ask the Soviets, the Russians also? He says, no, the Russians mean nothing in Iran. What means <laughs> the, 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 the British that year. He goes and asks the British, the uh, 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 Bullard. And Bullard says, well, listen, you, you're in the middle of the elections and you don't need it now. You, you don't need to do this thing. So anyway, that, that doesn't work out. Again, a little bit later, uh, uh, Again, goes to uh, Mossadegh and says that I want you to. Mossadegh at that time was the 14th Majlis and was a member of the Majlis. And he says that, uh, 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 okay, I want you to become prime minister and then clean this thing, you know, that is happening. I said, uh, let us go. Mossadegh says, yes, I will. But uh, in order to do that, uh, you have to, I have to be able to go back to the Majlis if they don't vote for me. 
but that was against the uh, uh, Constitution. They take it to the Shah again, does that, takes it to the Majlis. The Majlis says that that cannot be, and therefore that doesn't happen until, you know, comes uh, later on, you know, when Mossadegh becomes prime minister. And even then, a member of the parliament uh, 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 that is, was very, very close to the Shah, he is the one who suggests it. That is the, uh, you remember the name of the guy? Uh, he's, uh, Imami, Jamal Imami. Hmm. Jamal Imami was, was one of them. So essentially, there were this, this kind of relationships at the end. Uh, again, uh, the reason why this happened was that Mossadegh uh, uh, closed the, uh, the Majlis. And once that happened, you know. That but they had a feel for the country. And they could and they could speak to the Shah. Yeah, oh, I mean, there is a yeah, yeah, they could speak to the Shah, but directly the feel, the feel for the country doesn't mean that those people who were out, uh, afterwards they don't have the feel. They don't have the feel. Well, for the I mean, country. there is a passage. In fact, they were in many ways, in many ways, more nationalistic. Right. In the sense, in the sense that they could did not as easily as Qabam Sultan played, for example, talked, for example, with the British, that they would ever go and do that. Or, or this thing. So I'm not quite sure that that is uh, the correct uh, thing. But I mean, I, I, I always oh, remember a story that uh, Bernard Lewis told me that he was in Iran in the mid 1970s, and he was the guest of the uh, of group of generals, and he was at a cocktail, and they were keep talking, and they were talking. I'll try to keep clean. And uh, and the uh, generals were all complaining about the Americans that they can't do this without the American approval, they can't do this, they can't do this. The Americans are checking them everywhere and they just feel neutered, uh, to which Bernard, after listening this for literally you know, more than a half an hour, he just turns to them and he asks, he says, can you pee without the American approval? Did you have something? Yeah, I just I'm want to add you. that uh, after the repression of June 1963, yeah. we know that a delegation of the elder statesmen went to see the Shah to tell him, look, I mean, be a little bit more careful. And he threw them out. Yeah, I mean, he threw them out. So uh, it's uh, in some ways uh, his own doing, but not only at the elite level. Remember that mm -hmm. one, of the, uh, uh, one of the people who <coughs> mobilized the streets for the Shah was a man by the name of Shaban Jafari, mm -hmm. uh, Shaban the Brainless, as he was called. <laughs> well, by the 1970s, he no longer had access to the court. Uh, he, uh, in 1978, uh, he tried to mobilize the streets, but nobody would listen to him anymore. So that's when he fled. So there was a disconnect with um, some of the deep forces in Iranian society. Yeah, a quick would, question. Very quick. Oh, okay, uh, uh, Frank Record, a former State Department official. Ray, I wonder if you and the panels could just, I don't know how you do this briefly, but put the Iran revolution in context, it, a little bit out of the, the, the uh, exact details of how it happened, what happened, but, but the significance of the revolution. In terms of, like, in terms of the Soviet revolution, the common turn, the whole role of the, of the Soviet uh, revolution was to spread revolution. It's a global revolution. It was really not supposed to even be in the Ru uh, Soviet Union in Russia. So how does that relate to Iran? Are, they, are the Iranians, based on their view of the revolution, as, you're, as they understand it, are they trying to say that's a formula for spreading the revolution in the region, in other similar countries, or does it not apply? Is it sui generis or not? You want to start? Well, I mean, that's a very good question. It's a big one. Uh, now, I think there's been several transformations in the way uh, the regime views the export of the revolution. Uh, I still think it's a vibrant proposition, but uh, obviously uh, the regime's relationship with the Sunni world, Sunni fundamentalists, Sunni radicals, has shifted and transformed itself radically. You can, you can look at you know, someone like Montazari, who obviously at one time was probably the most Trotskyite of the primary characters, and by the end of his life, uh, he was certainly no longer there. I think the regime expands now primarily through using sectarianism, and I think it's been highly successful. So do they still, in theory, see themselves as a vanguard of an Islamic rebellion? Yes. Uh, in practice, however, I think uh, it's changed significantly. Uh, I have to 
I don't have any time. That's what I'm yeah, told. Yeah, I think that's I mean, it. That's, that's, I'm sorry. That's all the time I have left. I want to thank the panelists for coming, and thank you all as well. Thank you very much. I hope this was all right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah. My name is Toby Dershowitz. On behalf of FDD, I want to thank Professor Shahabi, Professor Afkami, Ray, Ruel, and my colleague Bernam for sharing your insights today, uh, stemming from your personal experiences and also from your keen analysis as scholars of the Iranian Revolution. FTD welcomes the opportunity to share a range of expert views from our stage so that our audience here in DC and also those listening in C-SPAN and live stream can benefit from your expertise. Today, the Islamic Republic is at the center of much turmoil in the region and beyond. Yet, Iran has a proud history and a population that may be poised to take back the reins so that they may fulfill the hopes for a representative government and a free society, which the revolution arguably failed to deliver. I want to thank you for a most illuminating, timely, and rich discussion. But speaking of rich, we are honored to have with us Rich Goldberg, to provide remarks on behalf of the administration, brief remarks, picking up where the panel left off, Rich will reflect on policy today with a look toward what the future holds. Rich Goldberg is Director for Countering uh, Iranian Weapons of Mass Destruction at the National Security Council, where he plans, directs, and coordinates the development of policies related to denying Iran all pathways to nuclear weapons, countering Iran's development of ballistic missiles, and other delivery systems, and stopping Iranian proliferation of such capabilities to its allies and proxies. He coordinates interagency development and enforcement of economic sanctions to counter Iranian WMD and missile programs. Rich has years of experience dealing with Iran policy, working across the political aisle. He was regarded as one of the most creative and effective staffers during the 10 years in which he worked on Capitol Hill as Deputy Chief of Staff and Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to Senator Mark Kirk. There he drafted and negotiated legislation promoting human rights and democracy in Iran, including sanctions targeting entities that provided the Iranian regime with the tools of repression. Rich is a reserve officer in the US Navy. Prior to joining the NSC, Rich served as a senior advisor to FDD. We're honored to have you here with us today, Rich. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Rich Goldberg. Well, thank you so much, Toby, for that introduction. Thank you for having me, FDD. 40 years of failure, that's what the Islamic Republic has produced for the Iranian people. In a country with such vibrant history and culture, advanced educational opportunities, and plentiful natural resources, the people of Iran rightly look at their leaders today and wonder, where did all our money go? Billions of dollars wasted on terrorist organizations far away from Iran's borders. Billions of dollars wasted on threatening missiles that serve no defensive purpose. Billions of dollars wasted in Syria. Billions and billions not spent on the Iranian people. Inflation is out of control, prices are rising, and Iran's leaders spend money sending missiles to Yemen. Workers are striking, the Riyal is under enormous pressure, and Iran is headed into recession. But Iran's leaders keep pouring resources into Syria. Layer on top of that the decades of corruption, graft, and diversion. Money siphoned away from the Iranian people for the personal enrichment of an elite few. 40 years of failure. It's no wonder the Iranian people are finally asking a basic question. Where's the money going? 40 years of failure is 40 years too long. The Iranian people could have a much brighter, much brighter future if their leaders chose a different path, the path of a normal nation. 
As Secretary Pompeo has said, the United States is prepared to fundamentally change the relationship with Iran, including diplomatic and economic relations, if Iran's leaders fundamentally change their behavior. Comply with international obligations and expectations when it comes to missiles, nuclear activities, proliferation, and human rights. Release our citizens. End state sponsorship of terrorism. Stop threatening your neighbors and fomenting chaos outside your borders. Until Iran's leaders decide to put the interests of their citizens ahead of their own self-interest, the U.S. maximum pressure campaign will continue and strengthen. We know where the money goes, and it doesn't go to the Iranian people. And so the United States will do everything we can do to dry up the money the Islamic Republic uses for illicit, dangerous, and destabilizing purposes. When the president says maximum pressure, he means maximum pressure. As Special Representative Hook recently noted, jurisdictions that receive significant reduction exceptions to import Iranian crude should not expect those exceptions to be renewed. The oil market is well supplied and can absorb the loss of Iranian crude. U.S. sanctions will be enforced. As Ambassador Bolton and the State Department have repeatedly said, special purpose vehicles are no exception. More sanctions are on the way. The reimposition of sanctions in November should be considered a first step. It's a baseline, not a finish line. 40 years of failure, 40 years too long. We know where the money goes, and like the Iranian people, we've seen enough. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rich. Our goal today was to better understand the role of the Iranian Revolution, um, and what it, how, you know, what it played in terms of the annals of um, Iran's history, and to explore how Iran can one day achieve the aspirations of its people. According to Reporters Without Borders, in the first 30 years following the revolution, 860 reporters were arrested, imprisoned, or executed, and many more have since been. FDD shares in the hope of seeing Iran a free country where the kind of discussion that we had today is possible without retribution. Please join me in once again thanking my colleagues and Rich Goldberg and our distinguished panel for a really enlightening and in interesting conversation today, and we look forward to having you with us again in the future. Thank you.